We'd be nowhere without grace. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 is where we'll be taking our text this morning uh, while you're turning there. Uh, remember to pray for our missionaries. Uh, we got a letter from Brother Kraft and I neglected to bring it this morning. Uh, it may be in one of our bags downstairs, but uh, things are well there and he asked for us to continue to pray for the work. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, and we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 16, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and, and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord thy God, my God. Surely after I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him. Still, therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely... Have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. I'd like to preach this morning, the Lord be my helper on the thought, when I truly repent. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we praise you for each and every person that's in the building this morning, because we know it's by your divine action and not by happenstance that they're here. Lord, we pray that you fill this place with your presence this morning, Lord, that the Holy Spirit may come this way and minister to us individually, Lord, and that you would be uh, with us as a people together. Lord God, uh, bless what we do. Bless the Word. Fill your house with your presence this morning, Lord. We pray for the lost that meet among us, that today might even be the day that you would speak to them, Lord, that you grant them repentance and faith and we'd be faithful to give you praise. And the glory and the honor for it, for it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, we'll be preaching on repentance this morning. And uh, what you will find may surprise you when you begin studying the King James Bible concerning repentance. Because the person that repents the most in this book is God Himself. He is the one, you know, he, he says, uh, the first time he repents, it's, it's in the book of Genesis chapter 6, and he says, it repenteth me that I have made the earth. Uh, I'm sorry, I wished I hadn't done it. It, it. it didn't, you know, that is a repentance. Now, it, it boggles my mind how an, an entity like God can repent, and he does no wrong. He's never done anything in error, never will do anything in error. He's perfect and He's God. And how then we can't. I mean, you think about how few repentant sinners you've seen in your life. And you know what? You can be a repentant sinner and be redeemed. You know, when the Lord saves you, He doesn't change your nature. You're still a sinner. The only thing is that you're covered by the blood of Christ. And if you don't believe that, just watch how people act and you see that they're still very capable of sin in all that they do. And so, why then as we as a people fail to repent? And I'll give you one answer and we'll see that it bears out in Scripture. It's pride. Pride is the problem. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, as we look about our churches today, and our churches are drying up on the vine, and the deadness has filled them, and there's staleness among the people, and it's all this 
There is no repentance. The answer is simple. In 2018, we must repent as individuals and we must repent as a people if we want to see a move of God like was once seen in this nation previously. Now let me say this, this nation is gone. Uh, I, 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 I'm not only into politics, I personally like President Trump, but listen, he's not the answer for our nation. Uh, this nation is gone. You know who repentance has always been for? God's people. Repentance is not for sinners, for sinners outside the blood of Christ. It's for us. Repentance belongs to the redeemed. And so then why don't we, uh, why don't we take advantage of it? Why don't we delve into it more? And again, I'll say the reason is our pride. Verse 16, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping. Now, if you know the book of Jeremiah, the people were fixing to go into exile and were going to be taken away in the Lamentations of Jeremiah. The next book in your King James Bible, that does happen. And he laments for the events that happened there. And this is just prior to them being arrested and carried away. And he tells them, stop weeping. Now, you think about yourself and you think about your... What brings you to tears usually? And every one of us will say the same thing probably. It's the loss of something. Usually an individual that we love, or it may be a home, or it may be an automobile, but loss always brings us to repentance now, or to tears. And it is no different in, the, in that day they were losing their nation. They were going to be annihilated nationally. Israel was going to be gone, truly gone, and they began to repent. Now, this is the thing different between then and now. Jeremiah said, hey, we're going down the tubes. The nation is going to be gone. There's nothing going to be left, and the people believed it. Wouldn't it be an exciting today, thing today if people began to believe the Word of God again? See, that's the difference. You, you know one reason there's no repentance is because people don't believe. Uh, oh, I believe in the Lord. Well, why don't you act like it? Right? See, you know, you can tell me one thing, but what you do means a whole lot more, does it not? You know, if, if I told you the building was on fire and you began to leave, I would say, well, yeah, they believed me. But, you know, today we can say that we believe in God and it don't impact us individually at all. It don't impact the places we go. It don't impact the things we do. It don't impact how we run our homes. It doesn't impact anything. So really, how can we say we believe? It would be, it'd be very difficult, would it not? It'd, it'd, be, it'd be hard to gain hold on that if we say we believe and it doesn't do anything to our lives. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy, for thy work shall be rewarded. Now that's an unusual statement in there because he says you stop this crime, you stop the tears... For thy work, you underline that in your Bible, thy work shall be rewarded. And the reason I say this, Baptists don't like works. Campbellites love them. <laughs> Baptists don't even like the word. <laughs> and the truth lies somewhere in between. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, work. You know, it, it is a work of repentance. That, that, is, that is earmarked in your Bible as a, as a work throughout the Scriptures. And, and he says, listen, I've heard you. I understand. I, I, I understand what you said. I'm listening. You know, it is a wonderful thing to, this morning that the mighty God of all the universe is listening. And, and the question is this, is what is He hearing? What's he hearing from you? What's he hearing from me? You know, uh, I, I dare say many times, at least on my behalf, what he's hearing is nothing but bare silence. Me not saying, blessed be the name of the Lord, holy and mighty and glorious are your ways. Not even asking for help for my grandbabies. That's the day we live. 
How long has it been since you prayed for your children and your grandchildren? You see, we live in a very unusual day, but because judgment was coming and the people were convinced, God says, hey, I've heard you. I understand what you're saying. The second part of the verse says, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. <laughs> and there is hope in thine end. You know what? What a wonderful thing. And there is hope in thine end. You know what? In my end, when this, when this flesh is done, when I'm dead, and y'all bring me out in the lot beside the church over here, and you put me away, there's hope. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, me and Brother Junior were just talking about that. And I think Mike and I were talking about it too. The Bible says this. Uh, <laughs> In a, in a, as, soon, uh, as soon as we're dead, our spirit is home with Christ. Uh, and then the body comes later. Yeah. But the minute I'm gone, no more worries. No more stresses. That, that's a piece that, you know what, we really don't even understand yet. Because, you know, unless something traumatic happens... In the morning, about 6 o'clock, I'll wake up and take a shower, and I'll hit the ground running, and been doing it for over 32 years. And you know what? Uh, Social Security is petering out, so probably I'll do it the rest of my life, as long as I'm alive. And, you know, it just gets tiresome, doesn't it? Well, to think about never, ever, one more worry again. So, Jeremiah encourages them and says, Listen, the Lord's heard what you say. And there's hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. Now notice, uh, he says you're coming home. You're coming back to your own border. Now, listen, this only makes sense, but... You can't come back if you've never been. Does that make sense? In other words, if you're not redeemed, it does you no good to come back. Repentance then is for the redeemed. It is not for the lost. Did you know that? It, it, it is for the redeemed. Now let me say to this to you, lost person, this morning. If He saves you, you'll repent of what you've done in the past. But the repentance I'm speaking of this morning is for the redeemed. He says, you will return. You'll come back again. And you know what? I'll go a step even further. If you never come back to the things of God, you probably never had nothing to start with. If you can live and wallow and sin and stay there the rest of your life, don't go back to some little pity pat prayer that uh, sister so-and-so made you speak. Because you know what? <laughs> The Bible says this, that we are to bear fruits of repentance. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith, against such there is no law. And if we don't have those, how can we possibly claim to be redeemed? You know, I believe we've about duped ourselves in these last years, thinking that huh, I'm so, just because you say you saved, you are. Verse uh, 18, I have surely heard Ephraim. Now this gets into what repentance is about. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. Now, bemoaning you hear, but you don't hear it in the spiritual realm. Bemoaning means in telling people your problems. Now, Bemoaning, when I, every morning when I get up, I get up and get going, as the old people says, and I guess I throw myself in that, until, until I get up and get going good, this right hip just kills me. And, it, you know, I have to swing it a few times and bear weight on it a little while and down a couple of Tylenol and, and, and get loosened up. And man, I tell Donna about that. Man, my hip's bothering me again. This weather must be coming in. I'm hurting. Donna, this hip. You know, I'll be on that, but I won't be on my spiritual needs. And you know, uh, Donna, 
Same way. Larry, I can't sleep flat anymore. I have to sleep up and, and I have to do this and I have to do that. And you know what? She's right. She's telling the truth. And she is telling me that about that all evening long. But does she moan her, bemoan her spiritual needs? See, that's the nature of the flesh, is we'll talk about it all the live long day. But we won't talk about our spiritual needs. Right. You know, what, what about if I said, you know what, I hadn't heard from God in a long time. You read the Psalms, and how many Psalms of David? Uh, the very man, the Bible says, a man after my own heart. And he says, hear me, Lord. See, he would get concerned when he had heard from God, wouldn't he? You don't hear that among God's people much anymore, do you? And you know why? As blessed as that book is, you know what? That's not hearing from Him in the spiritual sense, is it? Have you never opened that book and it's like you're reading a, 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 a story? See, to hear from God is to feel His presence. And you, and, and you just don't find that anymore. And, and so we find here that the writer says of Ephraim that he was bemoaning himself. I'm in a bad shape. And he means the tribe of Ephraim. That whole group of people. We are, we are in a bad shape. We haven't heard from God. We're fixed to go into captivity. We need some help. The whole people bemoaning their situation. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thus. Thou hast, thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised. Now, what your little health and wealthy teachers tell you today is God doesn't chastise. But the funny thing is, is the New Testament says in the book of, uh, of 1 Corinthians, if you be without chast, I mean, in the book of Hebrews, if you be without chastisement, then you're bastards and not sons. So you know what that says to me? He does chastise. He does whip you. And if He doesn't whip you, you don't belong to Him. Now, all my kids are just about grown now, except for little Bella. And you know what? If she gets out of order, I'm going to whip her. She's mine. She belongs to me. And saying, you know, that, that should be how it is for all of your children. They belong to you. You know what? I don't whip my grandchildren. You know why? They're not mine. They're my grandchildren. Let Adam and Matthew and Sarah and Dessa take care of their own. Right? Because there's a parental relationship there. You see what I'm saying? And, and then we as the Lord's people, it's the very same way. So if you can live like a dog and never hear from God, you have a real spiritual problem. If we don't have chastisement. So Ephraim is compared to here uh, that his chastisement was like a bullock. It was like something that would not be led. Now notice, notice what it says, bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock I'm unaccustomed to the yoke. Now, there is your problem in the modern day is unaccustomed to the yoke. Now, right here is your yoke. That's your yoke. And you know what? We're unaccustomed to it. When, when he says, Larry... Go visit so and so, and I don't do it. That's unaccustomed to the yoke. When the Bible says in, in First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians chapter six, come out from among them and be you separate. You know what? And we don't do it. That means we're unaccustomed to the yoke. We don't like how it feels. We we buck against it. Now I've never yoked up or anything, but uh, Bella's little pony. It's hard to get uh, uh, when, when we put the guide on him, put the bridle on him. And you know what? Uh, what I've learned with Matrix is about the only way I can do it is feed him. And while he's being fed, I can, I can uh, get him tied up. You know what? God don't do that. He ain't going to appeal to your flesh to get you tied up. He'll tie you up and then you'll live under the yoke. 
Now, you know, uh, th this is the thing. Uh, <laughs> we live in a day of, where people have mishandled grace that we don't even have to do anything anymore. Mm -hmm. But this is the funny thing. The Bible says you're bought over for Christ, therefore you glorify God, which is your reasonable service. That's just reasonable. That's nothing extraordinary. That's not. So if we don't serve Him, how can we possibly claim redemption? How can we possibly say, yes, I'm saved and, and, and never serve Him in any way whatsoever? I believe the truth is this, that we just can't make that claim and, and, and be genuine. So, he says that he was like that rebellious animal. The last part of verse 18, Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. You know, what a wonderful thing. He says, you turn me, and I'll be turned. In other words, you jerk, you jerk that right bridle, and I'll go right. You jerk the left bridle, and I'll go left. You know what? That's where we need to be. When he says to do something, to follow through and get her done. When he says, that's not where you should be, don't go there. When he tells you, listen, that's not something the child of God would do. You stay away from it. That's following the bridle. And you know what? Ephraim had finally got to that point. But now this is the sadness of the matter. Ephraim lost everything before he got there. And we do too a lot of times, you know. Uh, we need to follow him now. We, we need to obey him while there's life in us. And we need to... We, we need to snuggle up to the bridle and to the yoke and do exactly as He would have us to do. Verse 19, Surely after that I was turned, I repented. Now notice, after following through with what was said, then He said, I repented. I, I became sorry of my sins. I began to weep over my situation. Uh, you don't find that anymore. You know, people don't weep over the sin that they've allowed in their lives. How the coldness has crept in, and how they and, and, and what they do because they just they just don't. They 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 no longer repent. Now repentance is this. And, and a uh, sad truth that a Baptist preacher had to look it up. Uh, repentance is this. is recognizing your ways are not before God. Here, I, I never really knew what the definition of repentance is. Everybody uh, says, well, that's being sorry. Well, I, I was born sorry. Right? Uh, that, don't, that don't mean nothing. But repentance is acknowledging your ways before God. Say, so, you know what? This is not right. And, and, and that is the problem today. Everyone thinks they're right. You know, uh, this is one thing I, I've come to, and I'll say the last five years. This book is the final authority. And I don't care if Sister Sally told you so. If it's not in here, Sally was wrong. Right? Amen. And you know what? I found a lot today that, 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 that they're just going on what somebody told them. You know, uh, you know what the Bereans were? <laughs> uh, in the book of Acts, the Berean church, it says that they, they searched it out daily in the Scriptures. That's what we need to do. And, and so we find then as the Lord's people that repentance is an element that we have to have. If we want to live and be close unto God, repentance is something that, that we have to have in our life. Surely after that I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed. Now, did you get that? It's a very sequential set of events. I turned, meaning getting away from the sin. I repented. I, I, I acknowledged it before God. And then I was instructed. You know what that says to me? You know why we have a bunch of stupid Christians? And when I mean that, ignorant of the word of truth, it's because they've not repented. Because without repentance, you can't be an instructed, right? That's what the Bible says. And so, a lot of times, you know, have you ever picked up that book? Uh, man, I just don't get this. I, I just don't get it. 
try to paint it and then read it again. Right? I, I just don't understand this. I, and, and you know, everybody wants to put the King James Bible because of, of the Old English language. You know, that is not the problem. The reason that we can't understand this is the sin in our lives. We need to set that aside and get that out of the way. And then this book will be joyful to us as it should be. I was instructed and I smoked upon my thigh. Now that's a Jewish thing, and we don't get it, but he literally meant that he did like this. And the reason why, they considered that the center of the body. Remember when uh, the servant was going to go find Isaac the wife, and uh, Abraham said, put your hand here and swear to me. That's what he was saying. Yeah, right. With the very center of my being, with everything that I have, you promised me to get a good wife. You remember that? That's what he was saying. So what this person was saying, in the very center of who I am, I repent. Now I believe, uh, maybe, maybe it was Abraham, I can't remember, uh, maybe it was Moses that smote upon his breast. Very same thing. You know, uh, th th this is what you need to understand. Anything that will bring that flesh low will bring the spirit man high. And the reverse is true. If you're doing something to encourage the flesh, the spirit man's going down. It's always been that way. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to, to find these things within our lives that bring repentance and get the flesh down where she needs to be. And that way the spirit man can worship. I smote upon my thigh I was ashamed. How many, how many people today do you really see ashamed? Now, I don't mean sorry they got caught. You know, uh, <laughs> you see a whole lot of that. Uh, that. That is not repentance. Being ashamed is that you feel guilty yourself. Just ashamed. Why did I do something like that? And no excuses whatsoever taking your own ownership. You know what? We live in a day where nobody wants to take ownership of nothing. If, if, if they go in and blow a, a supermarket away, it's their mom and daddy's fault. I'm like, no, it's your fault. You had the gun. You pulled the trigger. But we live in a day that, you know what? I don't care what your mama did. I don't care what your daddy did. I don't care how they looked at you. And, and, and if they knock you down a little, bit, a little bit, you know what? You still took that gun. You still took out those lives. And it's your fault. You don't find that today. You know where accountability begins? It begins at home, and when them youngins do something wrong, you fire up that backside because that's what it was put there for. And you know what? They become accountable to themselves. Yeah. You know what? Uh, sometimes Bella has a little issue at bedtime. She had it last night. And I said, girl, if you don't get in that hall and get in that bed, I'll put you there. And you know what? She went on the hall. And that's what we need. See, she, Lord, being our helper, she, if she ever goes and blows the super, supermarket away, she'll know it's her fault. You see what I'm saying? We, that, that's the problem with salvation today. How could you possibly ever be saved if you've never been convicted of your sins? If you're blaming your sin on somebody else, you know what? Then you wouldn't need repentance of it, would you? We need to take our own responsibility for us and, and, and just go with it. So then we, as the Lord's people, this morning we need to understand and know that we are to follow Him in every way and that will lead to repentance. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded. Now that word confounded means confused. Now, when you don't repent, you will become confused. We'll use abortion as an example. Abortion is a horrific crime that our nation will be held accountable for. 
and I don't care who says it's right. Now, you know what? And, and you can place yourself in this situation. Your daughter maliciously raped. She becomes pregnant. You know what? Abortion is still a crime. And as much as I, I would be horrified at that, it would be your responsibility and her responsibility to see that child is born and that everything is taken care of. See, you can't have it. There's not a specific situation where abortion is okay. The mother's life, that's the big one. Everybody wants to dazzle around. You know what? If it's God's idea for her to die, she's going to die. Right? No reason. We live in a day and age where that's so smudged that people just can't... I, and that's what he was saying here. I was confounded. You know what he was confounded by? He had allowed so much sin in his life without repentance. That which was right began to seem wrong. And that which was wrong began to seem right. We're there. 2018, we're there. And you know what? what you, the only thing you can do is go to this book and go with it. You know what? Uh, they can call it gay if they want to. The Bible says they're sodomites. And you know what? Men should not marry men and women should not marry women. The Bible says it's abom an abomination before God. And that's all I need. Amen. You know what? I don't care how much you like them and I don't care how long you've known them. The Bible says it's an abomination. But the only way that we can get unconfused and go with what this says is to repent. Yeah. That's it. Uh, and, and, and you know, otherwise, we like the rest of the world will be dragged in and we'll become confused and not kind of get it ourselves. Go me to the book of Job, chapter 42. Now, again, just to show you that repentance is not for the lost. We'll go to the book of Job. Now, this is the end of the book of Job. Job chapter 42. Uh, Job had some unusual friends. We'll find that God didn't necessarily wasn't that fond of them. Now, I will say this to some extent. Job told, Job's buddies told him the truth. You know, you know, sometimes we just don't like to hear the truth, do we? We just don't like to hear the truth. You know, uh, very simple things in the Word of Bible, in the Word of God, sometimes we just don't hear. Something so simple as a woman's hair is supposed to be long and a man's hair is supposed to be short, we just don't want to hear it. Right? We, I mean, you think how simple that is, and the flesh gnaws up immediately against it, right? But we find, we find that Job had a special problem. I believe his problem lied in his children. And I'll go back all the way to the second chapter of Job, when he offers that little sacrifice. And he says, it may be... My children have sinned. You know what? Job knew exactly what they were doing. They didn't go down to brother's house to, to, to read the Bible. Right? They knew exactly. Hey, hey, they went down there and had them a big party. And you know what? You know what those kids needed? They needed rebuke. They need to say, listen, you know what? I raised you better than that, and you had your filthy beer party, but you know good and well that it's wrong, and it's against the Word of God, and I just want you to know that you've been told. But instead, he goes out there and, and gets him a little lamb and arranges everything. You know what? What good did that do the children? You know what? Think about that. They didn't even know what he'd done. Right? You know what? You as an individual can never pacify anybody, God with anybody's sin. 
That, that's the Roman Catholic Church in a nutshell. You live like a dog, say a couple of Hail Marys, and go to the priest, and he does one of these things, and you're good to go. You know what? He doesn't have the authority to bear your sin. You bear your own sin whether you like it or not. So Job, you know what? He had no authority to offer sacrifice for his children's sin. You know, you know what? If they got out of the will of God, you know what? You know whose responsibility it was to offer them sacrifices? It was them men of their own houses to get down there and do it themselves. It was their responsibility. And you know that that again it gets back to personal accountability. Job wasn't accountable for what his kids done. But he wanted to take it on, didn't he? He he wanted that. You know what? Don't pamper your babies. Don't 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 make them don't don't you do for them until they don't even have any accountability left. Job chapter 42 in the very first verse. The Bible says, then Job answered the Lord. Now that was after the Lord God rebuked him up one side and down the other. You know what? Uh, Job had been through some rough times. And he, he began to, God, you don't know what, I, what I've been through. You took my wife and you took my youngins. And God took him up one way and right down the other. The whole 40th and 41st chapter is God's rebuke to Job. You know what? Don't you ever think for one minute anything any, that God's made an error in his When Judy died, you know what? Still in the flesh, I'm like, she was so young. But the only thing I can say is blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now Job said that at the beginning, read chapter, the very first part of chapter 2. But did he mean it? I can say anything, right? I can say that I'm six feet tall and have blue eyes, but that I'm still short with brown eyes, right? You see what I'm saying? We can say anything, but it doesn't make it so. And so Job had this level, this fleshly skin level of repentance, but he had never repented before God. You know what? Job still probably thought that he was right, but after the Lord dealt with him specifically and individually, then he comes to this, then Job answered the Lord, I know that thou canst do everything. Man, what an what, what unbelievable statement that is. I know that thou canst do everything. Do you know God can do everything uh, this morning? I mean, do you really know that? You know, uh, uh, that He can turn the, the sun back if He wishes? The Bible says He can do that. That He can give life back to the dead? He can do that. He did that for Lazarus, did He not? <laughs> Remember Martha's response? Lord, by this time He stinketh. And you know what? If you've ever seen a dead body three days in with no embalming, and I have, listen, Martha was right on. But my God made it different, did He not? See, that's the very same God we serve. And somehow we've come to the point where we don't see Him that way. And, and so as Job is speaking, as Job is speaking, I know you can do anything. I know thou canst do everything. And that no thought can be withholding from thee. Now, see, that's one thing about the character of God that Job had learned. When he said, it may be that my children have sinned. He knew exactly what the... In fact, he thought about it. And God knew it. When he was a little embittered that them, all ten of them kids got killed down at the big brother's house. He was upset. And you know, I would be too. I've never lost a child. I can't imagine what it would be to bury a child. 
But you know what? <laughs> I bet Joe went to the ten the ten party funeral. And he he did what he always did. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But in his heart, he was thinking something different. You know what? The Lord God this morning knows your heart. He knows exactly what's within here. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what he know what your motivations are. He 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 knows it all. And so a, 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 a characteristic of God that Job didn't know, he says, I know you know it. Verse 3. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I, I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Now, did you, did you get that? What Job, Job had moved from just the hearing about God to seeing God in all that He does. Uh, you know, even getting in your car and putting it into gear, God knows about every inch of it. Now, that, that's a sovereign God. Years ago, and, and I won't say my name, so it does, but there was a fellow who we went to Bonks Mills Church, and there was a family looking for a home to buy, and they got the deal on one, and it all fell through. And then they got a better house, and it zipped through the bank like you wouldn't believe. They were, they were in it in like a week. And the woman said she was giving praise unto God for that. And there was an older man there in the church, and, uh, uh, well, I don't know if God gets involved in that or not. Well, you don't believe He's sovereign then. You don't believe that He's in every aspect of your life. You know what? Uh, to the very point of the next step I make, God's in it. And, and if you don't believe in a sovereign God, you don't believe in God at all. And if you don't believe He's all capable and all fulfilling, then, then that is not the God of the Bible. And Job finally gets that after all that he's been through, he understood I have heard thee, verse 5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see of thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, if you know the story of Job, that's not his first trip to the ash pit. But it's the first time he was sincerely there. And if you know the rest of the story of Job, the Lord restored him. He got all his wealth back plus some. He had more children this time. And you know what? I bet that second set, set of young ones he raised a lot different than the first set. Don't you? See, he, 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 because he finally... I know what the ash pit's about. I know what repentance is about. You know what? I dare say this. Most believers today don't even know what repentance is. The ash pit. Sister Tass was talking about her, her mother-in-law or her mother, maybe one, using coal still. Coal's a very dirty heat, but it's a good heat. Um, that's the kind of stuff that you have to get into. That, that's what repentance was about in the Old Testament was getting down in the filth. And you know why? That was a picture of their sin. That, that showed how filthy and dirty and black their sin really was. Uh, would you do that? I dare say, probably, no one in the building would be willing to get that to ascertain repentance, would we? Now I thank God we don't have to. But you know what? It'd be good for us to be on our knees before God. To be so broken hearted about sin that we would desire, we would desire the, 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 the ash pit more than we desire pride.